So we, we can we can use these in concentrated amounts. We can use them in non-concentrated amounts to to cleanse ourselves, right? So using our literally what is out in nature, the food, we can heal our body. That's all we need. We just have to remove what whatever obstacles are in place and then replace whatever has been missing from the diet, which for people nowadays, it could be nu- nutrients, nutrient deficiencies. Also, there's a lot of toxicity, right? So these are kind of the basic things we need to do. Welcome to the Radical Health Rebel podcast. I'm your host, Lee Brandon. This work started for me several decades ago when I started to see the impact I could make on people, helping them to identify the root cause of their health problems that no doctor could figure out, including serious back, knee, shoulder and neck injuries, acne and eczema issues, severe gut health problems, even helping couples get pregnant after several IVF treatments had failed. And it really moves me to be able to help people in this way. And that is why I do what I do and why we have this show. In this week's episode entitled Gut Health and Autism, I spoke with fellow FDN practitioner Christian Yordanov about the importance of our gut and the gut microbiome and why it's so important to our overall health and also its links to autism. This was a really fascinating conversation and one that most people need to hear, especially those who have children on the autistic spectrum. As always, the episode does end on a positive note giving many options for those who are suffering from gut issues or autism. Enjoy. Christian Yordanoff, welcome to the Radical Health Rebel podcast. Thanks for coming on the show. Lee, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor, my man. Yeah, it's great to have you on. It's great to have a fellow functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner join me on the show. Yeah, I mean, you you were saying you were one of the first uh, FDNs, right? I was, yeah. Yeah, 2008, I, I graduated. So I think it started in 2007, I believe. But um, I think in 2008, I was still in kindergarten or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll let that one slide. <laughs> <laughs> so Christian, to kick things off, could you share with the audience your background, your history, and how and why you studied functional diagnostic nutrition? Sure, my... Um... Some of my history, I, I, I didn't exactly have the, the best diet and lifestyle for all, pretty much all of my twenties. Um, back, back when I was a kid, um, in my kind of my mid, mid, uh, teens, kind of fell in with the wrong crowd, and, you know how it goes, weed and, drinking and partying and stuff like that, ch- chasing girls. So, that kind of stayed with me. I went to study. Um, I'm from Bulgaria. I went to study in Dublin, Ireland, uh, um, to study computing science. And it really, those habits of partying never didn't leave me. And throughout my 20s, I dropped out of college throughout my 20s. I was working kind of bar work, various other jobs and um, not really doing much with my life. And it was around the time I hit 30 or so where I realized I've done a lot of damage and if I continue like that, I really won't be able to, I, I won't, I won't be healthy if, if I even live a long time, you know? Mm. So I started to, to make changes. I made a lot of mistakes along the way, but, um, one of the things that really got me into, into the health stuff was seeing folks like my grandparents, for example, really deteriorate, deteriorate in the last 10, 15 years of their life. And I saw they were just going to the doctor once in a while, coming back with more prescriptions. And I think back when they were, I guess, in their 50s already, in their mid-50s, they were already on five, six medications. And uh, my grandmother, she died a couple of years ago. She really, like, the, the last three, four years of her life were just torture. She had a few strokes and just... I didn't want to succumb to that. I didn't want to end up like that. So I, I dove into the health stuff. Um, that was around, I guess, late 2017, 20, and then early 2018, when I really started digging deep into neurotransmitters, microbiome, biohacking, all this cool stuff. And um, that is how I got into the health side. I wanted to undo the damage. So I, I especially was attracted to the longevity research because um, I wanted to do un- to see, could I undo all the damage? I quickly found out I could. Um, it, a lot of it is not genetic when it comes to chronic disease. A lot of it is lifestyle and uh, diet. So I started doing all those things. And then around 
uh, 2018 is when someone in my family, a child, was suspected of being on the autistic spectrum. So I immediately started diving into the research on autism because I was, I was just fascinated. Now, is this genetic? We seem to be told by the mainstream it's genetic. There's no cure. It's for life. And that's what all parents are being told. So I was like, let me, let me investigate this for myself. Uh, it was out of a desire to help the family at first. I quickly found out that most parents are not told the truth when their child is suspected or diagnosed with autism. The fact is that most of these children have um, a lot of health uh, issues, metabolic dysfunction of various kinds, and there's a lot that can be done. So uh, I tried to join some Facebook groups in kind of early 2019. <laughs> I was met, met with a lot of disdain from the parents in those groups. They clearly didn't want to hear it. So then I said to myself and to my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, I said, nobody's going to take me seriously un unless I write a book. So I set out to write a book in 2019 and in 2020 is when I published that book. So that's my first book. And yeah, since then I've worked with uh, children, uh, with parents uh, trying to help their kids. And I've, I graduated as an FDN in um, 2019. So I've been helping mm -hmm. folks of various ages and stages. I think m my clients range from two years old to 73 years old. That's kind of my diapason. Um, and yeah, it's been really the most rewarding work uh, that I've done in my life. And I, I, I quickly knew this was my life. Um, this was my life's journey, right? I had to go through all the horrible things that I did to myself, so that I could. I could. It was uh, someone. Someone likened it to a. It was a data gathering exercise. What not to do to have good health? And along mm. the way, uh, even when I was trying to do well for my health i made a lot of mistakes so i think that allows me to have a lot of empathy for my clients that come to me with a lot of confusion this diet that diet this nutrient that supplement so it's allowed me to really kind of put myself in their in the in their headspace and really uh understand the, the problems they're facing and then quickly help them shortcut the process back to health yeah so what were you what were you doing so before you started working in health, what job, what was the last job that you had? So I actually, around 2008, I fell into... Um, into when you were in kindergarten, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I fell into a customer service role for an online poker company, or an American company, and um, I very quickly progressed in a year from customer service into the software quality assurance department. So that, it, it was my sister who got me the job initially, but that kind of stroke of luck allowed me to get a career in, in IT, basically computing um, software quality assurance, which is just software testing, basically a, a glorified button pusher, uh, as I would like liken it to. And I would always joke with um, with some of my colleagues. Uh, I'd always say, "Guys, I can train a monkey to do your job," you know. But <laughs> but I was I was good at the job, and I, I was doing that for a while. And along the way, I out of my own volition, I I got into information security, data protection. When the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, was coming into force a year before that, I was already reading the draft document and whatever, and uh, I already started um, consulting companies and help small helping small businesses to do their data protection and uh, information security so I've, I've i kind of luckily got into computers I, I then went back to college uh late in my later 20s so i i did steer back on the path along the way um but i i would steer off for the most part until i met my wife and um i actually met her uh i was i just i had just turned i was about to turn 30 when i met her and I decided when I turned 30, I said, all right, this year I'm going to eat well. And I'm going to go back to training Thai boxing. And I'm going to do what was on my bucket list to do a fight, right? So I was 30 years old, working a full-time job. And I started training Thai boxing again. <laughs> Went straight into three, three times a week, two-hour sessions. Started getting battered. Literally the first session I went in. There was hard sparring because some of the guys were preparing for a fight. And um, 
I, I, I decided I'll do all of this on a fully plant-based diet. I, at the time, I was still kind of a little bit confused. I was influenced by some plant-based friends. And I said to myself, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to you know, go vegan, which is the healthiest, most optimal diet. I'm going to do this fight and I'm going to show that you can you can do this while on a vegan diet. So I was there slamming soy soy protein shakes, bro, and I was just doing all kinds of stupid things. And then I met my wife, you know, around the time and since then it really my life has sort of she was she was the person that really kind of helped me to say, "All right, I need to get on the straight and narrow for God's sake finally." Cool. So what, what was the um, the first thing you, when you got into health, what was the first thing you studied? The first thing I studied? So I, I actually, in back in 2008, I also did, um, I, that's when I kind of started uh, my first course in health, actually. Uh, it was personal training, fitness instruction in Dublin. Um, then in 2016, I started, uh, I started a course in neuromuscular therapy. Mm-hmm. That was that was when I was um, telling about training for that fight. So I was doing that while working my full time job. But um, I met that's when I met my wife, and uh, other things sort of took me away from that course. So I only finished the first part of the course, which was a, a certification as a sports and event massage therapist. So I did that in 2016, and then around 2018, I start I started doing other coaching courses. I did the holistic lifestyle um, coach with Czech, the Czech Institute, mm-hmm. and then early 2019, I started the FTN course because I I, I had seen it a, a while earlier. At the time, I just didn't feel like I I could uh, spare the funds, and but it kept screaming at me everywhere I'd go. It mm-hmm. would follow me on the internet somehow. I don't know what they were doing back in the day or maybe my my um cookies hygiene is much better nowadays with brave browser and whatnot but <laughs> i i kept seeing it as a sign from the universe and i was so fascinated by the lab testing and i i was a little bit intimidated at the same time but in january i said it i said it um i'm doing this course i had just bought one of dr walsh's courses on uh nutritional biochemistry and i said to myself all right i'm gonna focus for the next year on this get the nutritional biochemistry down and when i feel like i've mastered it then i will you know i'll have saved up a few extra bucks and then i can do the fdn course but (laughs) whatever however it happened a few weeks into uh you know studying nutritional biochemistry i'm like no way i'm doing this fdn course i have to figure out what all this lab uh work is all about right Mm. and um that actually segues really nicely into the first so normally uh at the time they were doing the the first test you would do was the um, the the salivary cortisol uh test but because i was in europe they they had just started using the dutch tests uh so for the listeners that's the dried urine test for comprehensive hormones so I was one of the first to actually get a Dutch test over here in Portugal out of necessity and I was super excited. It was it was again very intimidating because the test report is like 14 pages long or whatever. And um yeah, so I got the Dutch results a, a month after. I, I I collected it in January sometime the, the the test and I remember how shocked I was Lee when I saw the the test results my testosterone all my androgens were down low some some of them were below the bottom of the range mm. my uh, clearly from that my all my uh, estrogens were also very low below the bottom of the range my my cortisol nightly cortisol was through the roof like literally out of the out of the range um so i, I remember i was i was kind of on a trip in bulgaria for a couple of days and I, we were sitting down with a mentor from the fdn course and I was in look I was in such disbelief at my horrendous results that after that call with the mentor I called Precision Analytica up I called them up and I started inquiring could there be an like, could your machines have malfunctioned when you were doing my test and the lady was very nice she's like look just call call your provider you know we don't we can't help you with this sir you know you're you're crazy basically <laughs> um <laughs> so I was in such disbelief that I, I thought I was doing so many things right. Uh, I think at the time, 
at the time of at uh, the time of collection i was kind of doing low carb or keto i can't i can't the the details are a bit fuzzy but i thought i was doing a lot of things well right but it turned out that when i was doing some of my carnivore diet experiments um i was eating raw meat raw liver raw lamb for a while and i remember clearly one day i was doing all that and after lunch i would lie down on the floor on a gym mat and then on top of that i'd put an acupressure mat and i'd lie down on that and for 20 minutes just to kind of get some pressure off my lower back and it's really it's a nice uh, relief from standing all day and i remember I, f- i fell asleep on the map on the mat one day and i woke up maybe 45 minutes later and it's on a cold floor so i remember my temperature must have dropped because uh for the next two two or three or four days roughly i had a bit of a sort of like a cold symptoms so i thought maybe maybe after seeing the results after following up with a stool test the gi map seeing the parasites i had the the blastocystis hominis the giardia and whatever else i i feel like maybe i i i ate something in the raw meat the liver or something like that uh that potentially when my temperature dropped was given the opportunity to colonize quote unquote right mm. so that mm. kind of explained why my everything was bad and then when i started correlating it back uh i i realized i was i was waking up in the middle of the night which is a quite a serious um, sort of um symptom of of parasite infestation especially if you have an mm. itchy anus coupled with yeah. that and then i remember but teeth grinding teeth te- grinding, teeth as, grinding well. as well but to be honest uh i was also correlating it back to the the low carbon keto because if you're if you're not fully in ketosis you you can very easily enter into glucogen gluconeogenesis and that's you know facilitated by elevated stress hormones so waking mm. up in the middle of the night is another sign of blood sugar dysregulation and that's why yeah. now i tell my clients listen don't don't go to bed If you're going to do low carb and stuff like that, don't don't do it before bed. Do it during the day and then at the end of the day have a couple of tablespoons of honey before bed and I, literally yesterday was the first night I skipped it. So I I had my dinner at eight or my last meal at eight, and inst- uh, normally at 9 p.m. I would have a two tablespoons, sometimes three ta- full tablespoons of honey and I'd sleep like a baby. But for some reason, I wanted to test out my theory: is 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 it true or not? Because people always doubt you, so you you always doubt yourself. You know, when you're advising a lot of people, you want to make sure you're you're telling them right. And just like that, I I fell asleep in my chair in the evening. And then when I this is my regular routine, then when I go to my bed, I normally fall asleep again, and I sleep normally. But I couldn't fall asleep until like eleven thirty. So that's one simple thing that I I've learned along the way is. Top up your liver glycogen stores before bed, and you're gonna sleep a hell of a lot better. That's, but anyway, just to to get to finish off that story. So, yeah, so uh, I'd given myself parasites with my crazy experiments with carnivore, with keto, low carb. So I learned a lot of like by making a lot of mistakes. I learned a lot of things, what not to do, especially not just what to do. And FTN really helped me. Um, they the, uh, another Brandon uh mole mm-hmm. he when he was going over the gi map test with me he told me you may want to do a couple of liver flushes now uh and that got me onto the liver flush it got me onto parasite protocols now i do a parasite protocol twice a year my wife does it my kid even like my kid since the age of six months we've been giving her biocidin um she's never really had to take any like uh pharmaceuticals or whatever we we're always um even when it's been really bad we've been able to use herbals and occasionally probiotics to kind of keep it together um so i learned a lot man i learned a lot about uh, detoxification uh, i was doing hair testing on myself and my wife for months and then all my friends and my family members and then my clients when i started getting them so it, at the end for me it was an absolute um life changing uh experience and it changed the trajectory of of my life and career damn that was a long one sorry yeah that's good that's fine that's fine so the main thing i really want to talk about today is gut health and the, and the gut microbiome because <clears throat> they you know they really are such a vital part 
of our health. But can you explain from your own perspective why the gut and the gut microbiome are, are so important to health? From my perspective, the more I learn, the more I realize Hippocrates was right. And I, loosely, loosely quoting Hippocrates, he, he said, uh, all, disease, all disease begins in the gut or something along those lines. Or death begins in the colon. doesn't really matter what the exact quote is. But um, the more I learn, the more I feel like he's right. So r- recently, because I just started writing my next book uh, a few weeks ago, so there, there'll be one short chapter on kind of base, uh, basic things everyone can do for their gut to uh, keep their gut healthy. And I, I was just kind of looking into endotoxin more and more, right? Now, just for the listeners, endotoxin is a slightly more colloquial term for what is known as lipopolysaccharide or LPS. And uh, this is basically a fragment of the outer cell wall of certain type of bacteria, the, the so-called gram-negative bacteria. And we we all have gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria in our guts. They're part of the the commensal, the so-called commensal uh, populations. So these bacteria that produce this endotoxin are always in the gut. And um, some of them are detected, we can detect them on, the, for example, the GI map. And they are, um, th- some of them are under a category, They the, the, the lab, um, Diagnostic Solutions Lab, they, they call them potential uh, autoimmune triggers, or there's certain potential, potentially dysbiotic bacteria. So that's to say, in normal amounts or in, in low populations, these these bacteria don't pose a problem for the organism. But if allowed to overgrow under certain conditions, they can cause problems. And part of that, the the problem they cause is when they when their populations increase, the turnover increases. They sh- when they die, they shed some of this LPS, the lipopolysaccharide or endotoxin, and that can get into the bloodstream. It can activate certain receptors in the body uh, that initiate inflammation. So I think anybody, or, or rather everybody, has in their own gut the seeds to disease because we all we all have this endotoxin producing bacteria so it it at that point another uh, quote from hippocrates is let let food be thy medicine and thy medicine be thy food i think that's another pretty profound thing that's why it stood the test of time for you know a couple of thousand years is because if we have the potential we, if we all have these um, endotoxin producing bacteria in the uh, in the gut in our guts we, we have the potential to to create for them to create disease if we don't you know if we do the wrong things let's say with our diet and lifestyle but that that also goes to say if if we are in a tough spot if we have some dysbiosis or whatever we can use foods to heal our body right so for example uh, a lot of a lot of um uh herbs plants plant foods they actually have antibacterial properties anti yeast anti parasitic so and we over the over the ages we've discovered a lot of them you know like wormwood pro, maybe that's why it's called wormwood that artemisia is good for parasites worms and cloves are good for uh, I think for the eggs and um, black walnut leaf I believe <clears throat> those are all antiparasitics and then we have grapefruit seed extract that's really good for yeasts oregano. So oregano oil is really good for bacteria. It's an overall really good antibacterial, antipathogenic. But um, uh, so we we can we can use these in concentrated amounts. We can use them in non-concentrated amounts to to cleanse ourselves, right? So using our literally what is out in nature, the food, we can heal our body. That's all we need. We just have to remove what whatever obstacles are in place, and then replace whatever has been missing from the diet, which for people nowadays, it could be nutrients, nutrient deficiencies. Um, also, there's a lot of toxicity, right? So these are kind of the basic things we need to do. So I guess from, to answer your question, in my my uh, my view is that the gut, It's there's a reason why it's really 
permeating the the zeitgeist nowadays but i guess like anything that comes into the mainstream it's it seems like the message has become somewhat diluted or or warped or twisted because um a lot of people now think oh i have <clears throat> i have this population of bacteria there's like uh 10 or that outnumber my cells 10 to 30 times so i have to feed them so we are kind of told you need to eat a lot of fiber to feed this bacteria but if you ha- again going back to ha- to what we're we're talking about earlier if you have these um endotoxin producing bacteria in the gut do you really want to just start throwing f- fuel on the fire that that, that cre- can cre- create these endotoxins that can especially if your gut is leaky they can get a lot of, a lot more can get into the into the bloodstream and start causing inflammation so uh that's kind of uh that's kind of where i see where i see us right now people think that they're all benign and then occasionally maybe a pathogen can come in and then we just use antibiotics to get rid of that uh i think that's a little bit uh of a two dimensional view i don't know what what's your kind of take on it Julie, a 47-year-old who works in computer sales, came to see me complaining of lifelong irritable bowel syndrome, which included severe abdominal pain and bloating, loose and very frequent stools, along with hot flushes, menstrual brain fog, and low energy, which affected her work performance. After taking a comprehensive history, plus running some labs, I discovered that Julie had a parasite infection, which may have been causing the loose stools a methane-producing bacterial overgrowth that was almost certainly causing the abdominal bloating and pain, a leaky gut, low levels of digestive enzymes, as well as eating too many high oxalate foods on her vegetarian diet. So Julie reduced the high oxalate foods from her diet, plus she took a broad-spectrum antimicrobial supplement to help with the parasites and the bacteria in her gut, probiotics to increase her good bacteria and help repair her gut lining, She also took prebiotics to help feed the commensal bacteria, digestive enzymes to improve her her digestion, and herbs to help clear the toxic lipopolysaccharides from her system produced by the overgrowth of gram-negative bacteria. At the end of the program, Julie reported that her health had never been better. In her own words, the improvement is staggering. The abdominal pain and bloating was gone. Her stools were back to normal. Her energy was up. She no longer had brain fog or hot flashes and her immune system had improved as she no longer suffered from frequent bugs and colds. If you're suffering like Julie was and you want to get to the root cause of your problem, you can arrange a consultation with me at bodycheck.co.uk. That's B-O-D-Y-C-H-E-K. And if we're a good fit, I could help you achieve the same kind of results as Julie. Now, back to the podcast. The gut obviously plays so many different roles in in the body, and one one really important factor is its role in in the immune system. So when you think of you know the skin as a barrier to our body, well, so is our gastrointestinal tract a barrier, right? Because whilst people think if they put something in their mouth, it's in their body, well, technically it isn't. It's inside the tube that's inside our body. So we've got a tube that goes from mouth to anus. Yeah. Part of that is the is the gastrointestinal tract. We're a donut, essentially. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And when you when you think that, well, where where do we absorb most of our nutrients? Well, it's in the the small and the large intestine, right? So that's where we need the most barrier. Or, or immune system function. So one of the important things about about the gut and the gut microbiome, first of all, is the breaking down of our food stuffs into small enough constituent parts so it can actually feed through the intestinal tract as it should into our bloodstream and then our body can do whatever whatever it needs to do with those nutrients. But at the same time, whilst allowing those nutrients through, Another main part of its role is to keep out the things that you don't want in your bloodstream. So the pathogens and perhaps food that hasn't been digested well enough at that point. Because one of the thing, one, you know, one of the theories is if you if you absorb foods through your intestinal tract that hasn't been broken down effectively, mm. 
your immune system within your bloodstream still won't recognize it as yeah. the the amino acids or or the lipids or the saccharides or whatever because it's it's too big mm -hmm. so now your immune system is going to attack that yeah. so that's going to cause inflammation as you were saying the other thing about the gut is the makeup of the microbiome so you know one of you, one of the things you were saying about you know the lip, the lipopolysaccharide producing bacteria if there's too many of those that also creates toxicity and low grade inflammation mm -hmm, in the mm -hmm. body and that can cause almost any disease right if yeah. you've got low grade inflammation in the body that could end up as almost anything I and it can be quite serious it could be you know an arthritic condition or it could be heart disease exactly i've seen i've right? seen the they're finding lps in atherosclerotic plaques yeah mm. so so that that's really important but then you've got the gut brain axis so that we know that our gut and our brain they're in close communication with each other so whatever's going on in your gut can actually affect what's going on in the brain so it can be it, it can potentially cause um mental health issues but also neurodegenerative diseases yeah. so alzheimer's parkinson's dementia etc mm. etc the other thing also you've also got the gut skin axis which is something that i'm quite big into because mm. i do work with people with skin conditions so again if the gut isn't optimal you could end up with acne or eczema or psoriasis or um actually i had a client this year or well he actually worked with me for for longer than a year but he had um spongy form dermatitis mm. which is something i hadn't come across before mm. but from my experience generally speaking if you heal the gut you, you if not completely clear the skin i mean in a lot of conditions you do like if you clear the gut the skin condition goes away that's not a hundred percent of the case in my yeah. experience yeah. but in most experiences you clear the gut of you know whether it's bacterial overgrowth whether it's parasite whether it's fungus you clear that from the gut and generally the skin conditions go away yeah and you know, I, I recently started working with a lady that has multiple sclerosis. So I just started searching around PubMed. Um, and very quickly, I found that researchers are, are talking about, again, the, the gut connection with um, degenerative disease uh, conditions. Uh, and then I quickly saw that there's hypo uh, various hypotheses for Alzheimer's having the, the you know, the it's hard to say what kind of imbalance, but you know, whatever imbalance in the gut, it could be pathogen driven, increased intestinal permeability driven, uh, like you said, parasitic, uh, uh, fungo, it could be all of the above, but it seems like everywhere I look, eventually if I look hard enough, uh, we're going to find that re researchers are, are sniffing out gut, a, a gut component to the, to the condition or the issue. Mm. Yeah, and, and you know the, the the gut or the microbiome of the gut, we know plays a big role in in hormone and hormone balance. There's there's also the gut vaginal axis. Mm -hmm. So again, things like you know infections in the vagina can be can be gut related, yeah. as can um, uterine tract infections as well. So there's from a physical perspective. I, there's literally nothing that I'm aware of that can't be affected by the gut. Mm -hmm. You know, from a, from a, um, from another view that I'm again quite interested in myself, physical performance and and injury prevention or even injury rehabilitation, the gut plays a major role again because if there's inflammation in the gut, what what happens is that the the nerves will send signals to the spinal cord to say, look, there's an issue here the signals go to the brain and what the brain normally does is send a signal back to the same segments of the spinal cord and it generally causes an inhibition of what we call the type 1 muscle fibers mm. or the slow twitch muscle fibers so if someone's got an inflamed intestinal tract the muscles that tend to get inhibited are the abdominal muscles mm. the muscles that stabilize the spine the pelvis and the rib cage which basically stabilize the whole body so again, if someone's got a gut issue, that can lead to 
you know, sports injuries or even any kind of painful condition. And uh, athletes generally, it, it, depending on the sport, have a, suffer from a lot of gut issues because, it, for example, long distance runners, um, because of all that bouncing up and down, that creates some type of irritation in the gut. And that's why they get, at some point during during a marathon, they, they get the trots. Mm. Um, I, I believe that's because uh, the irritation causes the enterochromaffin, enterochromaffin cells to secrete serotonin, right? Is that Have you seen that? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. That's it's it's interesting. I've, I've just been told of someone who might contact me with that exa- exact condition. Mm. Um so, so I was going to start. You know, if she does contact me, then I will start looking into that. So, the, yeah, the, there appears to be. So, uh, most most people don't know that ninety percent of about ninety percent of the serotonin in the body is created in the gut, and mm. it plays a role in intestinal motility. So, if um, w- but f- if funny funny thing, I was actually looking into it a little bit more. Apparently, certain parasites like Entamoeba histolytica secrete serotonin. And in the presence of serotonin, they become more virulent. This is according to Wikipedia now. That's not even mm. controversial. And mm. um, actually, serotonin is part of the venom of certain things. And the, uh, for example, uh, stinging nettles, that stinging sensation is partly because of serotonin. So certain vertebrates, scorpions, uh, invertebrates even, um, have serotonin in the venom so i was actually quite surprised so if what can happen is if you're running a lot let's say or or doing long distance uh uh racing or just training training very intensely for example uh i remember my my thai boxing sessions there'd be a couple of hours and some of the fighters they would come they'll jog for 30 40 minutes before the session so that's coming in close to a three-hour session that's um a lot of time for the blood to be in the extremities and away from the from the the organs of the parasympathetic system right so mm. uh, uh increased intestinal permeability during the sport during the training is quite quite prevalent now if you have the irritation of the gut and the serotonin uh, gets released by the enterochromaffin cells yes that will cause some diarrhea potentially or loose stools at the very least but it will also, because of the increased intestinal permeability, it may also get um, absorbed in systemically. And actually, peripheral serotonin uh, is uh, is actually a driver of fibrosis, apparently. In fact, it can drive fibrosis. And from what I understand, in organs, you need to have the stage of fibrosis in order for cancer to be able to develop. So it appears like the... The gut it can be a, a significant source of. Uh, this is again where the Hippocrates sort of um, quote is: "All disease begins in the gut." If you have a lot of permeability and a lot of serotonin being produced because of some perceived threat, it seems like serotonin is more of a stress chemical than a happy neurotransmitter, as we've been told by the mainstream. It seems like that alone, that increase in serotonin can drive a lot of not just physical pathology, like I already said, fibrosis and whatever else, but um, actually uh, neuropsychiatric type things because we know like in in depression, uh, serotonin is elevated actually, which is the opposite of what pharma has been telling us. But Mm. even uh, folks in psychiatric research, um, they've acknowledged over the last you know decade or so, that serotonin is actually more often elevated in not just um, depression, but things like Alzheimer's, plenty of neuropsychiatric diseases. Even I saw even in autism, a certain uh, a certain subset of autistic individuals, serotonin is elevated there. So there you go, another gut br- brain connection that doesn't necessarily have to do with uh, pathogens in the gut, but it's still something that a pathology in the gut can influence behavior. Mm. Yeah. What would you say are some of the everyday practices that people mm. carry out that can cause problems for the gut? I mean, most of us, unfortunately, eat a lot of proce- ultra-processed food. Mm. And a lot of those chemicals are just straight up 
not gonna not gonna be good for the gut if they're they're either irritating um some of the some of the emulsifiers they can uh overtly cause um intestinal permeability i think i think the fact that so, so much of our diet and and i'm i'm talking i'm i'm sure most of the listeners listening to us are probably don't fall into this category so i don't want to paint it with a large brush but i'm talking about the majority of let's say the western world um and and to be honest not even the western world the, the whole world because i've i've done some work with uh families in um india and africa and what they're eating there is even orders of magnitude worse uh, than, than what we are eating the 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 only difference is that in the west we have access to amazing food it's a bit more expensive but people continue to buy the industrial ultra processed stuff and mm. uh that is a big driver of disease you know like if you look at our omega 6 seed oil consumption f- from 1865 to 2008 i think it went from uh jesus from one less than 1% of the diet to um at one point it was 11% of the calories consumed in the states and then it's at this point it's probably something like closer to 20% 15 to 20% i believe the numbers uh, i can't exactly remember so a lot of a lot of very inflammatory foods are coming into 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 our uh, gastrointestinal tract in fact these polyunsaturated fats a lot of them because these <clears throat> think about it this way these things go rancid at room temperature the human mm-hmm. body is much higher the temperature of the human body is much higher than room temperature so these things even inside our gut on the way to become part of a cell membrane or whatever other part of a, of the body they are spontaneously combusting or to auto oxidizing or whatever and they're causing a lot of damage along the way so i believe uh that's another massive thing most people still haven't really they haven't understood the gravity of the situation people were like yeah well i don't buy sunflower oil we don't cook with those we only use uh, avocado or, or coconut or olive oil and i'm like that's great but how many times did you eat takeout this week how many times did you go to the restaurant this month but well, every single one of those those times it's actually quite probable unless you were a bit mm. orthorexic like like many of the people listening to us or you know uh you know unless you're telling the server listen i i have a severe allergic re- reaction if i get seed oils can you tell the chef to use butter or olive oil to to saute my vegetables unless you do that you pro every meal you're having out of the house again take out or or uh prepared for you you're likely getting a few grams of pufas or uh, polyunsaturated fats so that is a huge huge thing um and then actually uh, the uh, what I was actually going go, going to talk about earlier is uh because foods like p- uh, polyunsaturated fats uh, a lot of sweeteners in the diet a lot of calories but very little nutritional value because of that uh a lot of us are quite deficient our, our diets are quite deficient in minerals for example zinc if you, especially if you're if you're more plant based or a lot of my female clients they don't eat a lot of meat not by not by choice it's just they can't eat you know a 300 gram steak or whatever they eat a bit and that's all they can muster and through over the years you know you might have a child or two children through this um you know you're you're actually going to get quite depleted in zinc and you need zinc for uh, uh hydrochloric acid production right you need zinc for pancreatic enzyme um uh, uh creation of those uh, enzymes and an, obviously a number of other things immune function etc etc et so if you're <clears throat> just one deficiency let's say zinc which i believe is quite rampant again plant based uh, uh or plant heavy diets and eating uh, just to add if you eat a lot of uh, um grains or <clears throat> polyphenol rich foods a lot of plants with your meat with your source of zinc the some of these things chelate the zinc 
in the in the stomach and in the gut. So you have mm-hmm. your oxalates, you have your phytic acid. Um, I think I, don't, I can't remember if tannins or whatever. Uh, but uh, some of these anti nutrients will chelate, bind uh, uh, calcium, magnesium, uh, zinc, iron, and you might not even absorb them. If again, if you're combining, let's say, uh, beef with oatmeal or something like that, you a, lo- a lot of the iron and the zinc in the beef is going to get uh, chelated and absorbed, or, or rather, chelated and ex- probably excreted before it has a chance to be absorbed. Right. So, so uh, zinc deficiency leading to hypo hypochlorhydria or low. Uh, hydrochloric acid production in the stomach, that alone now predisposes you to more uh, bacteria potentially colonizing the small intestine. <clears throat> Coupled with reduced pancreatic enzyme production, because again, the, the zinc deficiency, now you have a, a, a potential for f- uh, uh, undigested food particles to make it into the bloodstream like you were saying earlier, Lee, which is quite a mm-hmm. quite a common occurrence. So, from that problem, now you have uh, you're going on to potential small intestinal dysbiosis. You're going to um, uh, immune system activation, potential cross reactivity. Some because we know that some of these undigested food particles they can resemble um, parts of our tissues. So we we have this concept of cross reactivity or molecular mimicry. So that can actually, over time, if left unchecked, can lead to autoimmunity. So just one deficiency of one mineral, Jesus, how many things can happen? And now, in this state, you're more predisposed to more uh, 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 nutrient deficiencies because of these things. Be- because if you can't if you can't break the the food f- down fully, if the intestine is damaged, if there's dysbiosis, it further prevents you from absorbing and assimilating the food better. So this one thing can lead into a a whirlwind of of uh, of uh, hellish problems for a person. Yeah, I mean, when you look at uh, hunter gatherers, and they've had their microbiomes tested. You know, they would have. I mean, there there isn't a perfect microbiome, but if you if you kind of put them on a bit of a pedestal, because all they eat is a completely natural diet for them. You know, so they let's say that they they are the gold standard, let's say, and then you compare that to someone in the Western world who's eating processed foods, and the makeup of their microbiome is very very different, and obviously they they also have all the diseases that come along with a uh, a dysbiotic microbiome, whereas the hunter-gatherer types tend not to have chronic disease. Exactly. And um, the only issue with that is that people look at uh, look at the Hadza or, or the Maasai or whatever, look, uh, look at their microbiomes. We have to get our microbiomes to be like that, and then we'll be all healthy. But, you know, you know that's kind of another very simplistic way of looking at it. Mm. I think the modern world has definitely killed off a lot. Uh, uh, probably our diversity has gone down in our guts, right? Which um, which probably predisposes one to more overgrowth, which is again mm. why I, I personally, uh, I prefer to do a, a quote-unquote a reset roughly every six months. So I'm not giving a chance for anything potentially pathogenic to overgrow too much. Um, and you can kind of tell, like, if you've had gut issues in the past and you know what that's like, let's say that they caused it, they caused you constipation, for example, and then you did a protocol and then you were you were having normal um, transit. You can probably tell down the line, if you, if you start to tend towards constipation, you can probably say, okay, it's either the food, you examine your diet, okay, it hasn't changed my diet, it could be like something is overgrowing, it could be some, something is being imbalanced. Because when something overgrows, it can cause other populations to go down. I, I've noticed on, especially on some kids, um, a lot of the quote-unquote commensals or the beneficial bacteria, they will be very low. And there might be like one or two pathogens, but not, not too crazy out of whack in terms of pop, uh, overgrowth. So it seems like um, 
when 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 uh when one one species tends to dominate whatever chemicals it's producing or exuding it can maybe be suppressive to other uh, other species right so um i feel like knocking it, it's it's like, the way i see it now it's it's like cutting the lawn right you don't want to get for uh, you know the lawn it's nice to have a nice green lawn but um you don't want it to be like six foot tall you can't see anything you can't walk through uh, and you don't want some some weird weeds coming up. So once twice a year, you you go in, go in and cut it, and then let it be. You know, don't micromanage it. So that's kind of the way I see it. Um, also with the with the with the hunter gatherers, I, I I think uh, again it's those experiments or those studies are very interesting. But um, I think every region of the world you have your own bacteria there as well. Mm. So I really don't think we should be trying to emulate. Any mm. anything that those guys are doing, because you know, if we're if we're gonna try to get our microbiomes like theirs, we have to get our lifestyles as well like theirs. So we have mm. to sleep naked on the ground, uh, have most of our skin exposed to the sun most of the day, which none of us are doing these things. Uh, they're not uh, being exposed to EMFs all day long mm. or blue light, you know, in the evening. Uh, they don't have the the. Uh, horrendous unprecedented amounts of psychological stress that we deal with so this is one thing actually i want to include in my book is um talking about like fasting and and intermittent fasting and this and that and ketosis it's like yes our ancestors used to do it but and just because they're adapted to do something and we're adapted to do it still does does it mean does that mean that that thing was optimal so if you're starving for 10 days back in the day it probably was because you just there was no food or you 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 failed at hunting multiple times or couldn't find any berries so you you survived that and and thank god for that thank nature but nowadays when you have access to really good food should we we be trying to emulate those activities that our ancestors did because because of you know upregulating autophagy, for example. Mm. Yeah, I think we need to try and get as close as that as we can, but within the environment in which we live. Yeah. So it can't be exactly the same. Um, Never can be. Yeah. But just just going back to the the question, I, I would obviously you mentioned food as being the main thing that people do that you know causes their gut microbiome to become less than optimal. One of the things you mentioned as well was electromagnetic radiation. So obviously mobile phones, Wi-Fi, all that kind of stuff also has a very negative effect on our microbiome. And again, the obvious ones, antibiotic use. Yeah. You know, it kills all the bacteria and leaves it open to pathogenic growth. And also chlorinated water as well. Oh, yeah. 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 Right. What is chlorine? It's bleach. What does bleach do? It kills germs. You know, so there are a lot of people that eat a poor diet they use chlorinated tap water and then they go to their doctor and get antibiotics whilst whilst they're using their mobile phone yeah yeah right so they're literally and and you know it's because people just either don't know and i would say that's most people just don't know but then i would imagine that a lot of people even if you told them that would just continue doing what they're doing anyway oh, yeah. unfortunately especially men yeah, yeah, men do find it a bit more difficult to listen to to advice. And al- al- alcohol is another thing that increases yeah, the alcohol, permeability. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah, definitely. And um, yeah, if you if you go on the week after a long day, being in the office, exposed to of course EMFs, crappy food, potentially chlorinated water. If because like w- living in Ireland, the uh, people drinking tap water. It was a very common occurrence. Like I said, I was working in bars for for a while, and people would drink, you know, five pints of Guinness, and then ask for a pint of tap water with all the fluoride and whatever. Mm. And they, they, it's like a reset in the, for the Irish, you know. Every, every five pints of Guinness, one pint of water, and you you're good to go. Next day will be totally fine. But you're getting all the chlorine and and aluminium and the fluoride, and then you know. Um, that that's after being so you do that in work you have a few drinks on the weekend you have like some some sloppy kebab or pizza 
that's you know some of these cheeses for example the or the additives in 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 the cheeses they have aluminium and it's legal it's registered with the EU so i think the um, to be on Lee, to be honest with you man at where we are as a society right now i am actually more, more surprised that more people aren't having very debilitating health problems uh and people are still functioning i think it's a testament to the to the strength and resilience of the human body the human organism mm. for for whatever reason we can take a lot of punishment before we just kill over and you know fall over and ask for help holly was a 28 year old personal trainer suffering from acne when she first came to see me holly had terrible breakouts and felt embarrassed and like a fraud when training her clients as she didn't think she was the perfect example of what it meant to be healthy. Even though she was a personal trainer and was trained in nutrition, she didn't realize the food that she ate caused her acne and affected her overall health. Following a few lab tests, it was discovered that Holly had fungal and parasite infections, as well as food sensitivities to gluten, egg, and soy. Holly changed her diet as advised, followed her metabolic typing diet, eliminated sensitive foods, and followed a plan to reduce her fungal and parasite infections to help heal her gut. The program worked to treat for Holly, and she was completely spot-free relatively quickly once the program was in full flow. She now has much more confidence, especially at work, enjoys her social life, and no longer has to wear makeup to go out of the house, which she really loves. If you would like to achieve the same kind of result as Holly, you can now follow a comprehensive step-by-step guide in my brand new book, Eliminating Adult Acne for Good, available now from all major online bookstores and via my website at www.bodycheck.co.uk forward slash books. Yeah, I guess the other thing that we don't really know too much about yet, but we're finding out more all the time is obviously the experimental injections and what effect they have on the on the microbiome. But I'm sure that that information will come out in the next few years or so if it's if it's ever allowed to come out that's another that's another story well i think with the, with those things anytime you perturb perturb or imbalance the immune system it's invariable that um you know something will happen because you, we we have some whatever 70% of the immune system cells are co-located in the that um gut associated lymphoid tissue so it's all around the the, mm. the gut lumen so if you perturb the immune system it can it can change i suppose over time it can change many things including uh, the tolerance to foods to foods so i think uh i'm not sure I, uh, if there's any studies on this but the peanut allergies and all these allergies in mm. kids nowadays well they're putting a lot of and and you know potentially antigenic allergenic things in the vaccines i'm not sure if they put peanuts and stuff like that but putting in the conventional vaccines yes they they, they certainly used to put peanut oil in them yeah. there you go and uh i think egg, egg yolks or, or egg mm. albumin so i mean that's that's an in fact autoimmune autoimmune diseases and allergic uh, issues and just all the general childhood issues are rising kind of in tandem with the with the vaccine schedules since the mid 1980s so I, I think you have to be very disingenuous uh if you're a researcher nowadays to to deny that or a scientist or whatever a doctor well that kind of nicely leads me on to my next question and it's about a subject i know obviously you're interested in you've mentioned it already and that's and that's autism and you know at the beginning of the show you said you got interested in autism because because of a, of a family member. Now, many people will know the story of Dr. Andrew Wakefield, who was a gastroenterologist from the UK, who became aware of the potential link between gut health and autism back in the late 90s. And that was because he was approached by so many mothers saying, well, you know, their child got autism and gastrointestinal issues at the same time. Are you, are you familiar with... Andrew Wakefield's yeah. story. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously, you know, and you mentioned earlier you've you've written a book on on autism. What what can you tell us about gut health and autism? And, and more importantly, what parents uh, can do to help 
uh, their their child that might be on the autism spectrum. I think if you, I was saying this in another interview. If you give me a thousand or ten thousand or a million children with autism, and I'm allowed to put a, a bet whether something like a GI map will find pathogens. Mm-hmm. I'm willing to bet every single time, a thousand bucks every single time, uh, that I would be right. And I, uh, you can run an infinity amount of people through this ex- uh, thought experiment, and I will come out on the other end a very rich man because that's how, um, that's how certain I am that most of these kids have some type of gut pathology. Um, I'm not saying it's it's the only issue. But if if um, uh, if if it was my child right now, if let's say my child is being suspected of being on the spectrum, touch wood, and I'm not not that not that it's a bad thing or anything, but I I just know the stress associated with having uh, a special needs child because I've worked with parents. But if it was my child, the first thing I would do is immediately run something like a GI map uh, stool test. Um, and potentially an organic acids test uh, to see to see um, what the picture is in the gut. And usually, at least in my, from my experience clinically, usually we have a, a certain overgrowth of either a commensal with low, let's say, lacto lacto and bifidos. Um, there'll be some type of there'll be either Clostridium difficile. Which we can we can detect with the organic acid test or or just Clostridia species in general seem to be overgrowing a very very often. Candida is almost a given. High oxalates are very common, which could be because of Candida or other fungal stuff or mold. Um, B vitamin B vitamin deficiencies are very common. Now we know we know a lot of these kids are um, they have a self selected limited diet, and that can that can usually uh, be isolated to just maybe a fruit or two or something sweet or bread or they like milk. So very limited. Actually, milk wouldn't be the worst thing in the world, of course. But um, the problem is if there's a lot of intestinal permeability and uh, pathogens, milk, milk or casein, um, certain certain uh, compounds in milk can be immunoreactive. They can have that sort of molecular mimicry we were talking about earlier. They can... Um, they can basically be potentially antigenic and cause further immune reaction and inflammation. So, um, gut, gut. I think the uh, focusing on the gut is the number one priority for mo- most of these children, unless you you can pinpoint a special, with, uh, you know, a, a precip- precipitating event like exposure to to a toxin, including a jab, which is very very commonly w- w- one of the biggest sources of exposure to to you know to these kids so yeah i think uh, these kids to truly help these kids this thing has to be taken seriously the whole um health lab testing nutritional supplementation lifestyle detoxification toxin reduction all of this stuff that falls onto the un, under the umbrella of sleep hygiene all of every single one of these things has to be taken really seriously you can't just do what is easy or what is convenient and what i've noticed is many parents they will do what's easy and um some folks for some folks the easiest thing to do is to order supplements and then I'll tell them, okay, but we need this kid needs to eat liver, you know, needs nutrients, real nutrients, not synthetic B vitamins and stuff like that. Um, and they're like, oh, well, you know, uh, so- sometimes people are vegetarians, like uh, for for religious reasons, reasons. Or in, for example, in Africa, you can't really find high quality food like meat and stuff like that very often. So they would prefer to to do some things, even though every single pillar is holding up this building, let's say, right? So you, you have to uh, reduce toxic exposures because um, if, if a child is not eating well because of a self-selected diet and, and they're not assimilating the, the nutrition because of a gut dysfunction, that means that their detoxification system will be compromised. So any toxins coming from environmental exposures are going to uh, be more of a burden on their system. So we have to really tackle... Uh, Tackle it from multiple different uh, places. Uh, same with sleep. If if there's gut dysfunction, the child is going to have sleep problems, or uh, and that is going to um, 
uh, feed into behavioral issues, aggression to self, aggression to others, crankiness, inability to focus, to learn new things. So uh, we can fix the gut, but if the sleep hygiene is out of whack, and if the kid is like staring at a, 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 a mobile phone for two hours before bed, that's going to hamper our, our um, uh, you know, our progress. So we really want to tackle all of these things. So in my book, I've, I've kind of talked about lab testing, the, the basic lab test. So like I said, a stool test and a, an organic acids test, these probably would be the, the two most important tests, at least one of them. Uh, with, um, with smaller kids, uh, stool testing is much easier than collecting urine samples. Now with the pediatric collection bags, especially for girls, uh, it's a big hassle. So um, with older kids, not so much of a problem. Then uh, I also like the dried blood spot finger prick test for food food reactivity, food sensitivities. Um, it's we know that um, it's there's many ways to react to foods, not just IgG antibodies. We know that there's many different ways, but it's it's a good it's a good way to quickly see. Or is something if something is off the chart, which sometimes there will be. For example, you know, with one, I remember one dad. He was very, he was very apprehensive uh, towards changing the diet. So as soon as I saw the the IgG food sensitivity panel uh, result, I'm like, oh, thank God, I have some, I have some leverage now to argue my point of view. And uh, we had for this particular child, we had the the gluten was off the charts. Casein was off the charts, and meat glue, which is the the mosaic diagnostics, formerly the Great Plains Lab, they have a in the food sensitivity test they have a marker for meat glue, and the meat glue marker was off the chart for this kid, and the dad the dad was like um I remember it was funny the the, the dad was like um uh, looking at this I'm like how how did how how is he reacting to meat glue i'm like what about those fish fingers <laughs> so i i was telling him from the from the start and he was like guilty i was telling him from the start you know you need to give your kid real real meat not fish fingers i know he likes them i know it's it's gonna suck to have to wean him off them or whatever but it's, it's ideally for for the best for the best outcomes we need to do that and he kept you know he just you have to well, at the same time, you have to maintain your own sanity. You know, people have jobs, people have other things, or sometimes other kids. So, when I had the when I had the the gluten, the the milk, and the meat glue as the only reactive things on the test, I'm like, look, these are the things that we have to take out of the because I I recommend in the book all families give the gluten-free, casein-free diet a trial for three to six months. And it's not because glu- uh, it's necessarily gluten causing your child's health problems or casein, but there's enough evidence that shows that people get uh, kids get benefit. So if you just remove potentially inflammatory things like, like gluten, casein, and a bunch of other grains, um, and and you, what you're also doing is you're replacing them with healthier things. So animal, other animal products, you know, butter, uh, liver, ideally. Uh, during that process, a lot of good things are already happening. Now we couple that with uh, a food sensitivity panel that we identify any specific foods that are highly reactive. That's another thing that's removing inflammation. The organic acids test or the GI map will tell us uh, what pathogens we have to, to uh, or are dealing with and what the, the best approach is to deal with those. So just these things already, we're removing a great deal of potential causes of inflammation. We're helping the gut heal by, again, removing obstacles to health adding better nutrition and then as well as that we want to add um we we want to add some supplements and the basics are you know a multivitamin high quality stuff of course methylated b vitamins um b6 uh um b6 b12 and folate like uh, in the methylated form um i, I think these are quite important because some of uh, quite a bit of research has shown that um, autistic kids have either some type of MTHFR polymorphism or high homocysteine levels or just frank low B12, low folate. And there's a lot of there's been quite a lot of research with B6 and high doses of B6 showing good promise. Uh, and there's there's just a lot of 
a lot of benefits from adding uh, B vitamins to the mix. Then, of course, zinc. Um, based on the zinc and copper levels in the in the blood, we can see if, if there's a copper overload, which is quite common. It's actually one of the most common or the most common imbalance in autistic children. It's very common in um, ADHD as well. It's a zinc and copper imbalance. So very low zinc, um, some, sometimes below the range, and high copper sometimes above the range. And th- this, this, this type of imbalance is actually very common in depression, postpartum depression, schizophrenia, and a number of neuropsychiatric conditions um, that a lot of people don't know that. Um, so fixing uh, or addressing of an imbalance like that already can have a lot of uh, benefits because there, zinc zinc uh, supports so many things from the immune system, like we said, we're saying earlier, uh, um, cognitive development, any number of things. And too much copper is uh, pro-oxidative. So balancing those levels, it has a lot of benefits throughout the body. So these things, and then I always recommend, I, I mean, like, I always recommend having red LED lights in the evening time. If the child is old enough, getting them blue blocking glasses with the red lenses. Just really working on sleep hygiene, get those habits in right. Uh, Epsom salt baths help. More minerals like more magnesium, calcium really help. Uh, And a lot of amino acids we, we use. So glycine to support detoxification. It's also an inhibitory um, neurotransmitter. So it really so zinc, calcium, magnesium, glycine, uh, taurine. Uh, these are really sort of inhibitory nutrients. So a lot of these kids, they seem to be in a very excitatory state. We know that uh, excessive glutamate and excitotoxicity is a is a feature of autism in in, in some some subset uh, of the population. So the more we can add these inhibitory things to kind of uh, o- not overpower the excitatory system, but just kind of push back so we, we are closer to an e- equilibrium. And also GABA, gamma amino butyric acid is, can be very helpful around bedtime before like a big, big event, stuff like that. So there's a lot that can be done. And all of these things that I said, you can implement them in in three months, you can have all the lab work done, the the diet changed, the nutrients ch- titrated in one by one, watching for reactions, making sure everything is uh, you know being accepted well by the child's body, uh, and it's in three months you you are already gonna see some benefits. Whether that's just general health improvement or actual symptom improvement, it's up to the child's um, specific uh, 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 case, right? In, in some cases, we we see you know pretty pretty stark improvement, but I I believe that's not the that's not the, it's not about symptoms, right? You know very well, Lee. We're not symptom chasers, right? Mm. We are looking to find out what is what in the body is impeding optimal uh, function. R- remove those things. What could be missing based on dietary lifestyle analysis? stress levels etc etc what could be missing so what do we add what do we try to take away what lab tests can give us the clues to what what to do and then put those things in gradually help support the family along the way and then the child's body will do the rest and i mean like these kids are so amazing um they bounce so fast like when you're working with a 60 year old person we can see progress is slow there's stops there's starts two ste- two steps forward one step back but with these kids, some of them, they're just like, because they're, they're in a high uh, state of super high vitality. You know, when you're young, all this life force coursing through your veins. So if you just remove a few things, add a few things, it's like. Psh. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting. I had the producer of the film Invisible Extinction on the show. And that's, and that's a film all about the microbiome. Hmm. And there was a. Uh, uh, a kid in China who had autism and he was, you know, in a really bad way. And they were giving him fecal transplants. And within, I think it was a six month time frame, he got to the point where he was just a normal kid in, a, in, yeah. in class. He didn't look any different. And all they did was change his gut microbiome. Amazing, man. The, the other things I'm aware of as well, in terms of, you know, things that have been linked with autism apart from 
well, some of them are still related to the gut, um, but glyphosate is one. Yeah. And again, what a lot of parents probably don't know is that there are some vaccines that have glyphosate in them. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Oh, wow. Yeah, I think it's the MMR. I think it's the MMR. Oh, I, I, I don't, don't quote me on that, but I think it's the MMR has glyphosate Jesus in it. Christ. Um, some heavy metals like mercury aluminium, and aluminium, yeah, yeah. which they use in childhood vaccines. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is electromagnetic radiation. And what what's been found is that even even if the parents' bed was in a place that had a high level of electromagnetic radiation, even preconception, they were more likely to have um, an autistic child. Whoa. So electromagnetic radiation and protect. You know, if you've already got an autistic child, protection from electromagnetic radiation can also be really important as well. I think anything uh, you have to. They're super sensitive to the environment, so anything you can. That's why I said we have to do all the things, not what's easy, what not what's convenient. Only we have to do all of the things, and I I I, I really think you're right because from what I understand, uh, the EMFs. They basically disturb um, ca- calcium metabolism. The channels. The calcium channels. So if you if you start having, what is it like? Calcium starts flowing inside the cell. Something. Like, I mean, that's that's the so this invisible energy leads to a physical issue uh, around the cell, and mm-hmm. you know, like at the end of the day, when the cell gets disturbed, that's literally the cause of, of all, all our health problems. Mm. Well, there's even the phrase now, isn't there? Mobile phone cancers, where people are getting cancers on the side of the face where they hold the phone. Yeah. You know, what does that, <laughs> what does that tell you? It's not a good idea, is it? And they never, they, they never, um, they used to say in the manuals that you're not supposed to hold it close to your, to your head, the manufacturers. Mm. So yeah. it's a, it's been classified by the, was it the I. IARC International Agency for Re- uh, Re- Research on Cancer it's been it was classified EMFs was classified as a probable human carcinogen wasn't it in 2017 mm. so that i think at this point that's all we need to all we need to know right yeah yeah awesome awesome so if you were to give your three top tips for someone or a, or a child to optimize their gut health, what would be the your top three tips to take away? I think doing a reset once or twice a year with something like either biocidin or olive leaf extract with oregano oil or something like that, or maybe like an antiparasitic formula with it, let's say uh, uh, clove, wormwood, and... Um, black walnut something like that for a couple of of weeks once or twice a year that that will mold the uh, mold the grass or mold the lawn uh, quote mm. unquote right yeah. um another thing i do i do um a couple of times a week so two three times a week taking a few capsules of activated charcoal doesn't hurt uh, they mop up uh, the the activated charcoal mops up various toxins in the gut uh, including endotoxin, these lipopolysaccharides. Um, so that kind of, it, and if you feel better after doing it, uh, if you take some charcoal and you suddenly feel better the next day or a few hours later, it probably means you might have a little bit of a situation down there that you you definitely want to do. Uh, follow the first tip and mow the lawn, as it were. Um, so I think those two those two would be sort of uh, preventative things um, in terms of. Uh, a pathogenic overgrowth uh but for for general daily life i just think just you have to really really not not become orthorexic but st- start being more intentional with what you put inside your body i think too many of us just reach uh you look at a menu in a restaurant or the way a dish looks and we just gauge food by hi- by how it tastes or you know what it looks like and i think we have to uh, have a different filter nowadays. We have to uh, maybe think about it this way. 200 years ago, my great, great, great grandma, let's say, did she have access to this food? Um, or could she have had access to it? Because, you know, you might you might have access to fruits and vegetables from the other side of the world. But if they existed 200 years ago, 
chances are they're not going to be as much of a problem as mm-hmm. uh, something that came out of a box that was made in a lab. I think anything yeah. that is not real food that was processed, created, put in a bag with preservatives, whatever other chemicals being used, uh, I think that should not make it inside our bodies for the most part. We all kind of, we we do live in the modern world, so we have to make allowances for it and not feel guilty about it because that can be just as bad as, or worse, more damaging the, than the actual food itself. So if you're in a situation where you have to kind of do it, um, that's fine. But for the most part, when you're at home especially, just buy real food. Don't let you know, non-real food coming to your house. And that, that solves a lot of problems. Yeah, the, the acronym is JERF, isn't it? Just eat real food. <laughs> yeah, I like that. I hadn't heard that one. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, this has been a really, really great discussion with you, Christian. What, what's next for you? Well, just a, a couple of weeks ago, I started um, writing my next book. I, I'm going to try and get it out by January next year in the next three, four months. It's going to be called something along the lines of shortcuts to better health, longevity and mental performance. So that's something I've been trying to work hard on. And it's a little bit hard to find the time uh, to really concentrate on it jo- throughout the day, but I'm going to keep trying to like cut meetings and whatever I can and just really power through and get it done. It, it's volume one. I plan it to be at least two volume, maybe possibly three volume series. Cool. Cool. And where can people find you online? Uh, christianjordanov.com and Lee thank you so much man this was such a great honor to, to be on here with you my man um, my pleasure my pleasure and just just um, you can also give a shout out to your to your, the book that you've already written just just to let people know again oh yeah it's um, the book is called Autism Wellbeing Plan How to Get Your Child Healthy it's uh, 300 pages of uh, information there's close to 500 scientific references to uh, in the book um, so it's well researched. It shows, it details. Um, the first half of the book details the the most the most common health challenges that autistic kids suffer from, based on the research. And the second part is all about solutions. So lab testing, nutrition, diet, supplementation, sleep hygiene, and how to put it all together. Uh, with the help of your practitioner, of course, because you you may need help with a lot of these things, but there's a lot you can do on your own. Um, and I think, like I, like we already discussed, everything is important. If if a family can get this information and apply all of it, I think they're invari- invariably going to get really good results. Yeah. Uh, and where's the book available? Uh, Amazon. It's paperback okay. and, and Kindle. And yeah, that's that's the, the place to get it. Awesome. Christian, thank you so much again for coming on. So I've really enjoyed today and it's nice to have a fellow FDN practitioner on the show. Yeah, Lee, thank you so much, my man. Thank you so much. My pleasure. So that's all from Christian and me for this week. But don't forget, you can join me same time, same place next week on the Radical Health Rebel podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Remember to give the show a rating and a review, and I'll see you next time.